Thank you, Beth, for that introduction. Uh, like you said, I'm the CTO of RLS Bio, which I co-founded about three years ago. And at RLS, we are engineering enzymes for the green manufacturing of non-canonical amino acids. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how I got here, but first I just wanna give everyone a quick intro on amino acids and why it's important. So there are 20 canonical amino acids, which are shown here. And these are the ones that are directly encoded by DNA and assembled by the ribosome into proteins. And so anything other than these 20 molecules that also have an amine and a carboxylic acid can conveniently be called non-canonical amino acids. And there are thousands of NCAAs that are known, including hundreds that actually exist in nature. But the synthesis of NCAAs is surprisingly difficult, and so most of them are not readily available. So what we're trying to do at RLS Bio is unlock access to these non-canonical amino acids so that they can be obtained more readily and apply. And the reason we think this might be useful is because non-canonical amino acids can serve as the basis of functional molecules that can be useful in a variety of applications. So for example, non-canonical amino acids can be used to modulate almost all of the properties that are important to, to drug development, such as stability or bioavailability or binding to a target. So this is why we think non-canonical amino acids are useful. And now I just want to talk quickly about how I even ended up interested in this problem in the first place. So my scientific journey begins in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I was born and grew up. And my parents weren't scientists per se, but my mother was a professor of the history of science. So science was definitely a topic of conversation growing up. And I had encountered chemistry a few times in grade school and was definitely interested in it, but I wasn't necessarily decided that I was going to study chemistry and major in chemistry in the future. But I was pretty sure I wanted to do something with science and technology, and also that I wanted to go somewhere really far from Maryland. So when it came time to go to college, I decided to go to Caltech in Pasadena, California. And so at Caltech at the time, everyone, no matter what you wanted to do, had to take an introductory chemistry class. So I took Chem 1, which was the most introductory chemistry class, and at the time was co-taught by professors Nate Lewis, uh, Jim Heath, and Dave McMillan. And what I found was that even though this was definitely an introductory chemistry class, it was already so much deeper than what I'd encountered in chemistry before. And I actually remember feeling kind of annoyed that this field that I'd encountered several times before and been interested in still, still had a lot of unknowns to me. It still felt almost like a new field. And so I decided then and there that I wanted to become a chemistry major and just really spend my time understanding this topic more fully. I'd also somehow gotten to this point without ever experiencing synthetic organic chemistry. So when I did finally encounter it in Chem 1, it just seemed really interesting to me. And so that motivated me to look for undergraduate research opportunities with Professor Dave McMillan and Brian Stoltz. And I'm just showing an example of one of the projects that I worked on as an undergrad. I was trying to make that target molecule on the right using the asymmetric plating catalyzed alkylation shown in the middle. And it's a pretty simple target, nice five and six membered rings, only one stereocenter. But what I found was that almost every step other than the key step was just really difficult. Lots of side products, lots of selectivity problems. And so the lesson that I took from this experience was A, that I was more interested in methodology than in target oriented synthesis, but also that I really wanted to learn how to use catalysis to try to control selectivity in chemical reactions that had tough selectivity challenges. So when I graduated from Caltech, I decided to head back to the East Coast to Yale University for graduate studies. And at Yale, I met Scott Miller, who introduced me to this concept of peptide catalysis. So the way peptide catalysis works is that you have some catalyst, you can incorporate it, you can couple it with other amino acids and amines using amide bond formation, so you can generate a peptide. And the idea is that if the catalytic region is mediating some reaction, the peptide sequence can be used to control and tune the selectivity of the reaction. 
So for example, you can render this epoxidation in anti-selective by creating a peptide embedded per acid, which interacts with the substrate in a way such as this. This is the source of the stereoselectivity in this case. So I was really interested in this, in this concept. And at Yale, I learned how to use peptide catalysis to control selectivity in complex molecular environments, such as in this site-selective and stereoselective oxidation reaction shown here. I also learned how to discover catalysts using combinatorial chemistry. So in this example, I synthesized a peptide library on a solid support using the split and pool technique. And I was able to screen this peptide library against a reaction. And if anything looked interesting, I could determine the sequence of that peptide that had given that interesting result after the fact using mass spec. So using this technique, I was able to discover a peptide, for example, that could control the product selectivity in the bare villiger oxidation reaction. So up top, you see the product that's, that's formed by electronic preference. And then at the bottom, you can see that the peptide shown there can overturn that selectivity and form the different isomer of product. And again, the mechanism we think is another example where the peptide scaffold is interacting with the substrate through secondary interactions like this. And so this idea of peptide catalysis is heavily inspired by what nature does with enzymes. And it's also seeking to emulate what nature can do with enzymes. And so while I was doing this research, I became really interested in, in just learning how you could engineer enzymes and just use those directly to catalyze chemical reactions. So I was lucky enough then to be able to go back to Caltech to do postdoctoral work with Professor Francis Arnold, who was doing just that. So when I got to Caltech, there was this new project in the group that had been initiated by Andrew Buller, who was a postdoc at the time. And this project pertains to the enzyme tryptophan synthase, which is shown here. So tryptophan synthase is actually two enzymes, trip A, which does the reaction shown on the left, and trip B, which does the reaction shown on the right. But as synthetic chemists, we were more interested in trip B specifically. So trip B is doing this reaction right here. It takes serine and it combines it with indole in a carbon-carbon bond forming reaction to form tryptophan, which is a new amino acid. And the synthesis of tryptophan is not especially interesting, but if you take a step back and look at this more abstractly, what's really happening is that the enzyme is taking two fragments of similar complexity and putting them together in one step to make a new amino acid. So I'll just talk quickly about some of the ways to make amino acids. So there are a lot of nice chemical methods that have been developed to make amino acids. I'm only showing a few of them here. And these have a broad an incredibly broad scope of products that they can make, but they have some challenges. So almost all of them require protecting groups and they're not always highly selective, even though most amino acids are chiral. And a lot of these methods actually use chiral auxiliaries or chiral reagents rather than catalysts. And I didn't mention it, but also in grad school in other projects that didn't, that weren't quite as productive, I had, a lot of experience making weird amino acids. So I had, I had firsthand experience trying to use a lot of these chemical methods. Then in complement to that, there are a lot of nice biocatalytic approaches that can be used to make amino acids, such as the ones shown here. And these methods are highly selective and you can produce the catalysts easily using fermentation because they're just, they're just enzymes. But some of these reactions are reversible, which is cumbersome to apply. And also in a lot of these cases, the enzyme is only really serving to set the stereocenter of the product, but most of the structure still has to be made in advance using chemical synthesis. So when I saw this reaction that was catalyzed by trip B, I kind of thought that it combined the best of both worlds between chemical synthesis and biocatalysis, meaning that like chemical synthesis, you're taking two starting materials of similar complexity and putting them together in a sort of in a synthetically convergent way. But then you also have the high stereoselectivity and chemoselectivity of biocatalysis, not to mention that you can do these reactions in water rather than organic solvent. 
So if we could engineer this enzyme to make more than just tryptophan, it could potentially be a useful way of making non-canonical amino acids. So being in the Arnold lab, of course, we chose this method to engineer TRIP-B. So we took, the, we took the DNA that coded for TRIP-B, we expressed that as a, we introduced mutations and exposed that as a protein library. And we screened that library against a reaction of interest and anything that was interesting served as the basis for the next round of mutagenesis. And in that way, we were able to find new catalysts that could make a whole slew of substituted tryptophan analogs, such as the ones shown here, we could actually push the, push the catalyst even further and convince it to accept completely different substrates to make classes of amino acid even beyond tryptophan. So while I was doing this work, my colleague, Christina Boville, who was a postdoc at the time, found that there was quite a bit of commercial interest in all of these weird amino acids that we were making. So we thought it might be a good opportunity for a startup company. So what does it take to start a company? Well, we asked experts, and the advice that we got could sort of be summarized as, be 10 times better. Okay, 10 times better at what? Well, there are a lot of ways you can be 10 times better. You can make 10 times as much stuff. You can be 10 times as fast or 10 times cheaper. So we thought, okay, we can probably be 10 times better in at least one of those categories. So in 2019, we decided to found RLS Bio. And so we moved up to the, to the San Francisco Bay Area and set about trying to turn this academic research project into an industrially useful process. And it took some doing, but we were actually successful in scaling this process from milligrams all the way up to multiple kilograms. And we'll keep going as much as we can. And because our method is so direct and it avoids really reactive chemicals and a lot of organic solvents, it compares very favorably to the chemical methods that would be required to make some of these amino acids. And that also translates into large reductions in things like waste generation or energy consumption or carbon emissions. And so with that, I'd like to thank my co-founder, Dr. Tina Boville, and the rest of the RLS Bio team. I'd like to also thank professors Francis Arnold, Scott Miller, Brian Stoltz, and Dave McMillan, as well as all of the research groups that I've had a chance to be part of. And I'd like to thank my family, which uh, grew by one just in the past month, and they've been incredibly supportive as I give startup life a chance. And I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity and for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. David, thank you so much for that talk. Um, I'm going to ask about uh, what has been the biggest challenge in moving from academia to a startup? Well, I think one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest challenges is that when you go to a startup, there's no, there's no infrastructure that's available for you. Like there's no university that you can rely on. So we, we basically had to, we basically took a large empty room and had to convert it into a lab entirely from scratch. And we had to seek out if we needed, you know, analytical equipment, we had to seek it out ourselves and, and find someone, find a location where we could use that. So I think that that's been one of many of the biggest challenges going from academia to a startup environment. All right, thank you. Uh, there are some congratulations coming in on your newborn, so I just thought I'd let you know that from, from folks.